So if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to I'm going to shift gears and move into uh, a, a conversation that continues our theme of action. It also continues our theme um, when we think about Candace and Dwayne about supporting the arts community um, and the and and how we engage um, in that work. Um, and so uh, I have um, uh, Priya and Paul here to talk to you and lead this conversation, two of our fund holders, who I will introduce in a minute. But I, I thought I better start by talking a little bit about giving circles themselves and, um, and why Toronto Foundation is in, in a conversation about giving circles. And so um, I should also say that this is an experiment. Uh, Toronto Foundation is trying to find different ways, as I said off the top, to disrupt the way giving happens. Giving circles isn't a new idea um, in society, but it is new uh, at the Toronto Foundation in so much as we're really starting to, um, as our fund holder community grows, we have about 650 fund holders who are doing their philanthropy through and with and in partnership with Toronto Foundation. Um, and wanted to find new entry points for uh, many of our keen fund holders to be leading things on their own, but in community. And so for us, a giving circle is um, an important and powerful way to create partnership through shared interests and values and, an, and a shared desire to make change. We launched a giving circle program some months ago and Priya and Paul both stepped up to form one. Um, and um, I thought I had an introduction to Priya and Paul here in my notes that I am not seeing. Um, uh, but I, I want to just um, uh, thank them for being willing. I'll get them to introduce themselves more thoroughly uh, in uh, when they start. But they, you know, some of the giving circles focus on issues in a neighborhood, but Priya and Paul's case, they wanted to build a community of support around a specific organization. Um, uh, and in this case, it's Why Not Theater. Um, we love this approach uh, and we hope you'll join them to learn more about Why Not uh, with Why Not Theater's founder and artistic director, Ravi Jan and his colleagues. Um, there is an always to start your own giving circle at Toronto Foundation. And uh, our colleague, Sarah Muir on our team uh, can help you with that. And I know she's in the chat. Uh, Priya Vir and Paul Nagpal uh, are, have been fund holders with Toronto Foundation since, uh, well, for I think th at least three years now. Uh, they're part of our Vision 2020 program. Um, and I'm, it's just, it's, it's amazing to me to watch um, uh, our fund holders really own their philanthropy and step in in a, in a really interesting and unique way. I think our theme today is the power of married couples. Um, uh, you can see Priya and Paul here. Um, uh, and the importance of their leadership. Um, and I'm, I'm just delighted to have them uh, join us and take the reins from me uh, and uh, host this next conversation. Awesome, thank you, Sharon. Um, so just want to uh, say good morning to everyone. Thank you for sticking around. Um, really just the, the purpose for, I, I guess, the next uh, 25, 30 minutes is, is to chat about why not theater, um, why we thought it was a, a great organization to be behind. I, I've known uh, Ravi and Sam for quite a number of years now. Um, I actually sit on the board of Why Not Theatre um, and am the co-chair there now. And uh, But really wanted to have a chat around uh, Why Not, uh, what makes it so different. Um, and I'm going to turn to to Ravi and Sam to really start chatting about um, why Why Not Theatre is different than all the other theatres uh, in the city and, and broader than that. Uh, thanks so much, Paul. Uh, and thanks to everybody, uh, the panelists. That was a fantastic panel. It was so amazing to hear about all those organizations. And I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to be able to, to meet all of you virtually and to share our story. Um, I'll just step back a little bit and tell you a little bit about me. So I grew up in Toronto, um, but I left in, in uh, 1999, as far back as 1999. This is There's going to be a little time travel here. So I left uh, to go to school, and I, I was really, you know, uh, privileged to go to schools in London, in New York, and in France, and I garnered a real international reputation for working with amazing high caliber artists, and I'm just one of those people who ended up in the right rooms, the rooms where it happened, and got to work with stellar, like, world-class international artists, so my resume was ridiculous. Um, and so when I came back to Toronto, it was really strange because uh, a lot of people didn't know 
Canada was really focusing. And, and so, so I came back in 2007, right? So let me take you back just to remind you the number one song in 2007 was Beyonce's Irreplaceable. The number one mu movie was Night at the Museum and the iPhone came out. So this is a long time ago. Um, but Canada was really focused on, you know, Canadian work. It's, it's look out was not uh, as heavy as it is now. And so a lot of people, you know, we're, we know this now that systemic racism is rampant in the arts and people's imagination to see me in their theaters wasn't really there as an actor. So I had to form my own company in order to make work. It's the same story that a lot of black indigenous and artists of color faced is if you can't work in the institution, you've got to make your own company. And just another thing for me, you know, theater was always about making political change. It's about active change. And I was always engaged in international context. I was working with an organization called Schools Without Borders, and I was working in the slums of uh, Nairobi and in the favelas in Rio, using arts to engage local communities um, uh, through, uh, to engage younger communities actually out of things like the drug trade or idleness or AIDS HIV education. And when I came back to Toronto, I was really lucky to find that community as well. And Toronto has a rich and vibrant community of particularly BIPOC artists who balance international careers and a real deep investment in their local communities, but they tend to be overshadowed by institutions. Because if I were to ask you right now, what is the arts to you? Most of you are going to gravitate to the symphony, the ballet, the opera, the AGO, the ROM, these are the institutions that we associate with the arts. We're not thinking about the local community center in Scarborough. We're not thinking about that individual artist who takes their Saturdays to gather a group of young folks together to, to tell stories. And then they do that on an international stage. And so, you know, balancing these kinds of worlds of, you know, community arts development and institutional arts was always a kind of place that where I lived. And I always wanted to make change in the institution. And so while I started my company, I was always trying to get away to those larger institutions. And there's a long history of um, my battle with with one particular institution in Toronto, maybe that's another time. But so, um, what makes Why Not unique is we are a BIPOC led, we, we're, we're, we're an artist of color led organizations and we have really shattered the ceiling for most uh, arts organizations. We, we've grown to become a $2 million organization without a venue. And this is huge historically across in the history of arts in Canada, arts organizations, small arts organizations are made to stay small. And this is a big kind of theme. What I'd love to share in this conversation is how do we grow? How do we change what the arts means uh, and, and who the leaders of the arts are, who the leading voices of the arts are? And we've just kind of poked our head through this little kind of groundhog hole and we're trying to build a new institution and, 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 and the values and foundations of what we do, uh, which I'll share is we basically do three things. We make and tour international work. And that work challenges the status quo of what stories are told and who gets to tell them. So examples of that, the, the one that was the big hit was I made a show with my mother, who's not an actor. Uh, and we tell the true story of how my parents tried to arrange my marriage in 2007 and it didn't go so well. Uh, it's a very funny story, but what it's doing, what I love about it is it's highlighting my, my immigrant mother, who's not an actor. It's giving her a platform. And we talk about the challenges of straddling two cultures and two generations and living in Canada. Right now, we're making a show with the great David Suzuki, a similar kind of non-actor play where we're trying to tell a story about how we think about climate. Um, we've also done traditional work. We did a, the, one of the first fully integrated ASL and English uh, productions of Hamlet. Again, getting us to think about different ways of seeing, different ways of, of, I love the term that kept being used was lived experiences. How do we understand lived experiences? The second thing we do is we share our resources to support other artists work. These artists tend to be artists who are not part of the mainstream on the margins. And uh, a, a big kind of approach that we take, and I think one of the panelists mentioned it, is, is one size fits one. We're not trying to cookie cutter. Each artist is different and we're trying to support them based on their particular needs and their contacts. And the third thing we do, and I'll talk a little bit about this, is we provoke systems change. 
And that's about removing the barriers of access for participation in the arts for artists and audiences. So this is about innovative producing models. This is about civic engagement and finding ways to, to make the arts accessible for everyone. Um, so those are kind of the three things that we do. And uh, yeah, that's what makes us different. <laughs> so so Ravi, maybe a little more, you, you've talked about how you decided to make productions differently. And you spoke a little bit more about that, the types of productions that that Why Not's getting involved with. Um, maybe give one or two more examples on the type of productions that are actually really pushing the boundaries and, and uh, making change. Yeah, thanks. So, so um, you know, Brimful of Ash, I'll just share it a little. Again, it's, it's one, you know, it's toured for nine years. It's been all over the world in Sydney, Europe, uh, America, uh, all across Canada. And, you know, it's a deceivingly simple show, which is my mother on stage telling a story, but the revolution of that, again, in terms, I took you back to 2007 for a reason, you know, we're learning now, you know, a, a lot of white folks are waking up to the, the, the systemic injustices that have existed that, that BIPOC folk have known for a long time. And the revolution of having my mom on stage to be able to tell her story is, is, is actually profound. Um, and, I'll, and Hamlet, I mentioned, you know, that uh, to have a deaf actor play the lead uh, so while the actor wasn't playing Hamlet, it was this whole perspective of the show was told through her lens, through her hands. And so to have an actor, to take a classical play, you know, a colonial classical play that, you know, is the thesis of theater is Hamlet. And so to have that centered around a deaf actor and a deaf experience, and in the casting, we defied all kinds of uh, traditional norms. So uh, we had artists of color, we had, uh, a queer Asian man playing a female part. We had a white woman playing a male part. Um, and that white woman had just had a baby six months before we started production, six weeks before we started production. So we, we, took, we took a lot of care to provide childcare support, to provide the support that were needed in order for that artist to tell the story. And then the big one I'll just share is a huge production of the Mahabharata, which is uh, an, a 4,000 year old ancient story. Uh, it's an Indian epic that we're telling. Uh, we were postponed this year because of COVID, but um, it's it's the first time it's ever been done with an all South Asian cast. Um, and uh, they're all from the diaspora from all around the world. And again, that's just important because it's about the who who tells the story. Um, and and as we know, representation is important and, and the, the owning that story and the people who get to tell that story changes how it's received. Amazing, thanks David. Um, and, and maybe just talk about uh, the systems change that Why Not's trying to push through uh, the discourse that we're trying to create in, through the arts. Uh, I'm super thrilled to share that. I'm going to send a link in the chat. I'm just navigating Zoom here. So this is a program I'm, we're really uh, excited about. When, when the pandemic hit, uh, this is called the ThisGen Fellowship. And it's a program that we created to support specifically uh, female identifying uh, BIPOC artists from across Canada. And the idea is how can we create access to help them take their levels to the, the careers to the next level? Because we all know, again, I, I'm just making the assumption that we're all on the same page about systemic racism and misogyny and, and uh, barriers that exist in all sectors. But in the arts in particular, um, this has been a, a major problem to create uh, opportunities for leadership. And so we created this program uh, and it was the online pivot. Here we are. Uh, what's been fascinating about it is we have, we have an amazing international reputation. So we know amazing world-class artists. All of them, when I called them to say, can you be part of this? We're like, absolutely, I am there. I have the time and I, have, I want to invest. And it goes back to this idea of our international artists who are invested in local community and change. And so if you look at it, if you get a chance, we have a director's program and a cultural leaders program, and it's all led by black and indigenous female identifying or trans artists of the highest caliber all around the world. There's one white lady who's a Tony award winning artist. She directed Hades Town. If you guys know, it's a big deal. Um, but that it, it, it's just about shining a light on this generation of leaders who's already leading. And part of how we came up with the title was a lot of people in the institutional world said to me, you know, you're such a good leader. You know, you're the only one. You're so articulate. And like, how do we train the next generation? Where's the next you? And I was like, yo, 
that's not true. There's tons of me everywhere. I mean, not me, but people like me. And we always think about skipping this generation of leadership. We always want to overshadow and think about the next generation. The next generation is, don't get me wrong, is fundamentally important. But there is a generation of people who are doing the work, who are leading the change. And how do we shine a light and support them, enable and empower them more so that the future generations can be that much more impacted by the result of that? So it's a national program that brings together folks um, in, in a kind of mentorship. And, and it really has, I can't, I can't express to you how unique this program is for Canada and how uh, impactful it's been. Uh, and we're just so proud of it and uh, happy to share more about it later uh, or when we get to meet again, I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm also gonna share, I don't, can you share documents in the chat? No, um, I'll just also share about uh, an initiative we're doing uh, to identify the issue, the problem of space. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, the arts traditionally uh, organizations are associated with venues and venues are really costly and uh, space in Toronto is a ridiculous cost. So when, when Why Not was in our massive growth phase, everyone said, you got to buy a building. And we said, you know, this is silly. If we bought a building, first of all, we'd have to raise $6 million. We'd never done that. Um, the model of a building is terrible because when you make a building and COVID is showing that first of all, I mean, no disrespect to anyone who has a building or a space. Absolutely. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. But to start a new one might not be the best time to do right now. Um, and so uh, also the capacity issue. There is a huge base of people, artists, particularly BIPOC artists, who need space. And if you build one building, you reach capacity too quickly and the need is so great. So we said, what if all of Toronto was our theater. And we think about all the empty space that exists in the city. There's so much empty space. Could we access it? And could we turn that into temporary rehearsal halls? And then we asked, what if space could be free for all artists? What kind of artists could we enable to become the future storytellers? And what kind of audiences would we then enable to come to, this, to the theater when we're ready to see those artists? So we're addressing so many issues. And then when, co so, so we, we ran a pilot with working with property developers, working with a bunch of different people to activate underutilized spaces, turn them into temporary rehearsal halls. And it was super successful. And then when COVID hit, obviously it got froze. And it's proposed an interesting new solution for us that we're excited about, which is, can artists play a role in the recovery of COVID? So we know that office and commercial spaces are becoming empty and Main Street is being emptied. And so how can we keep, living in Toronto is an exciting, vibrant city because it's got action, it's got life and people are engaged. And so one of the things we're trying to enroll in the next phase of the pilot that we're gonna launch in March, 2021 is, how can artists play a role in, in the recovery? So artists have skills and services that they can provide. So for example, if an artist provides a yoga class, that artist is like the economic, you know, precarity of the arts is being amplified by this moment and particularly BIPOC artists. And so if that artist could teach like a yoga class, could they be paid for their time? Could civilians uh, experience some spiritual, physical healing? Um, in that empty space, we're activating that empty space. COVID protocols, of course, need to be followed. But here's just a way where we can think about the arts, activating spaces, providing services, and um, you know, playing a role in this recovery. Um, and so these are things that we're gonna pilot and test out in, in the new year. So these are just ways we're thinking about civic engagement, how the arts can be at the center of a conversation and not adjacent. You know to have an artist in your office building versus at the theater you walk by on your walk to work. You know, I wonder how many of you have visited the distillery and just walk by that theater. Theaters can be so invisible in the city. And so, and part of that is because our understanding of where the arts is situated in conversation in our civic lives is adjacent. And we want to centralize it because, you know, that's what it does. It, it, it's active. It's activating people, it's storytelling, and uh, it's meaningful. Amazing. Um, so I only have one more question, but there are uh, there is a question coming in in the chat. And if anyone else has any questions, please uh, uh, do that there as well. So um, I'm going to ask Julia's question for her. Ravi, you've made it so clear why the arts are so crucial to social change. Why do you think that making the case for support remains an uphill climb? 
Um, because I don't think we all believe it. I think it's fundamentally, we just don't believe that statement. We don't all believe the statement in the same way. If we did, we wouldn't be climbing up the hill. You know, we don't have to convince anyone that, um, no, hang on, we, we, we still have to convince people that housing matters, that transit matters. You know, we, we don't all have the same values. We don't have the same beliefs. And that's, again, this moment of reflection should be asking us all to deeply consider. And for me, that's where the arts, again, can play a crucial role in helping us to understand others' lived experiences, uh, other perspectives, and, and to deepen our humanity. You know, I, I'm going off a little bit, but you know, we've been telling stories. Mahabharata's important because it's a 4,000 year old story. Stories are what makes us human. It differentiates us from animals. No other species tells stories the way that humans do. And there's a reason for it. And um, I think part of the uphill battle is we think that um, we don't know what the purpose of the arts is. And, and I would argue that that's because institutions have been the perspective, this dominant single perspective. And if we look uh, in communities, if we look in, um, at the roots of storytelling, we, we know and we understand that value. And so perhaps this kind of conversation, which I'm so grateful to have, um, is a means, a step towards connecting phil phil philanthropists to another layer of the arts to possibly change that, uh, to change that story for the good. Awesome, that's a great answer. Um, I'll say one other thing. Um, so, you know, for, for Julia, you said that Ravi made it so clear, right? Why, why the arts are so crucial. Um, but I think that's why we're all sitting here today is just to start, uh, you know, really start that giving circle to tell more people why the arts are so crucial, right? Because everyone here, so we have 42 participants right now, we all know very clearly why uh, the arts are so crucial. Um, but we want to amplify that, right? And, that, and that's why we're all sitting here to take that, that giving circle and expand it as, as far as we can. Um, so Ravi, I will ask uh, one more question and then I will try to read through some of these. Uh, wh what's next or why not? Well, so we're, we're really trying to build a new kind of institution. So we don't have a venue. We are national and international in our scope. Um, and, you know, we're, we're really trying to do something bold, which is kind of engaging with that question, which is trying to think about how we change our relationship to the arts. And it's not just about theater. Theater is one third of what we do. You know, it's for us, the business is and, and why the arts matters is, is because it's about people and relationships. And stories bring us together. They shape how we see the world and believe in the world. And, you know, I think for us, even though we're big now, I think what it is, it's, it's the comment, and I'm sorry, I can't remember which panelist said this, but that people of color or black and indigenous folks, they don't get time to think or money to think. And that's what we're looking to do is we need capital investment to grow, to be able to innovate and explore. Like as a company, we are innovating on the arts, we're innovating in models, we're innovating to remove systemic barriers. And we're constantly having to struggle to get the resource and the capital to be able to actually make those impacts. So the cost for us of the imp to make these impact are human costs on our team because it's like extra hours, we don't have the capacity and we're always struggling. And PS, this is true of all small arts organizations or small not-for-profit organizations. And how can we make deep, real investments with small? How can we think small actually um, and really make big changes with small? And the thing is, when you think small, $5,000 to us is a world of different, it can make the world. 5,000 to the AGO, and no dis, again, listen, I wanna be clear, no disrespect to the AGO. I'm only using them as a major institution example, but the impact is different. It's, it, it's equal value, it's just different, it's different. And so if, if there's one thing I could say, you know, obviously pitch for why not, but also pitch for small companies, small organizations, small not-for-profits, and, 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 and realize that your investment, your, your small investment has big impact in the small companies, in the small, small. Um, and that's where so much change is happening. And 
I, I'm just seeing that. How do I define small? I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, operating budget wise, uh, that's a great question. How do I define small? Um, you know, uh, there are a ton of companies who have operating budgets that are below, uh, you know, $500,000, below $5 million. I mean, I think that's for you to determine what you feel is small. I think, I think the, I guess it ties into why is it an uphill battle is, and what we're trying to change is just organizations who try to make change tend to not have the capacity, tend to not have the actual resource to be able to plan for a future, to be able to actually plan for how they think about making change. And you, you know, you're all probably a lot of you are in business, you're in maybe tech sectors, you know that you kind of need money to R&D, develop, experiment, try ideas. I think thinking like that when you're talking to small organizations as you define them, um, that, that would go a long way and, and uh, it could make a real difference. Awesome, thanks Ravi. Um, just trying to be cognizant and, uh, of, of time, um, maybe we should try to wrap up. I think there was a slide with, with contact info um, but really, if anyone's more interested in, in uh, joining our giving circle, um, would love to hear from you. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been really important to support Ravi and Why Not Theater in doing what they're doing. Um, hopefully he was able to uh, provide you a little bit of insight. Um, obviously, you can see his passion um, and their, uh, you know, Why Not's vision and, and desire to continue to, to grow and to scale and to continue to help uh, not just artists, but the community. So um, please reach out to me, please reach out to um, Ravi or Sam at Why Not, um, and hopefully we can continue the conversation and um, continue to support them. Uh, uh, and thank you all so much just for the time. Again, it's, it, it, the, first of all, the panelists, you guys were all amazing. Uh, it was so great to listen in and, and hear about your organizations and what you do. And thank you all for just, again, this opportunity. These are the kinds of things that are rare too, you know? when we think about uh, particularly, you know, um, Ratna Omidvar wrote a great article about systemic racism in, in philanthropy. And that's kind of where Sharon started a lot of this conversation. And even just to have this opportunity to be able to speak with uh, people who are even considering to give to the arts is rare. Um, so thank you, Paul and Priya for this circle and to be able to have an opportunity to just meet and get to know each other. And again, it's, it's, it's just to come back to it, it's sharing a story and it's people and relationships. And how do we just make the time to be able to do that? So thank you for this time and for your ears and I guess well, your eyes as well. <laughs> one last uh, plug because Toronto Foundation is doing this amazing thing for giving circles. So if anyone joins our giving circle by the end of this year uh, and makes a donation, um, Toronto Foundation is actually doing a matching uh, to that. So we actually get uh, to even further amplify our impact. Um, and then with that, I'll turn it back to Sharon. Thanks so much, Paul and Priya. You know, I think uh, Ravi, wow. Um, I, uh, I could hang out with you all afternoon and just uh, feed off the energy that you bring to this conversation and what a critical reminder um, that missing piece in our day-to-day -day lives is. I saw some of the chat talking about um, the, the 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 idea that in 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 the arts and in music you know you're you're usually gathered together side by side I, I was in the orcus choir for many years when I was younger and I was just reflecting on how enriching these parts of our lives are um I also wanted to call out the fact that Ravi mentioned I, I think it was the Hamlet example and having um, a, a disabled artist at the table and recognizing we've been talking a lot about BIPOC leadership, um, but the other piece of this conversation around equity is around disabilities. And I think um, there are some folks missing at the table for these conversations as we continue. I think um, it was an important reminder of where the arts can bring um, that front and center and make us really think. And I think at the end of the day, it's the rich reflection that comes from being part of an artistic venture that um, makes enormous difference to our quality of life. And it's why it's part of our vital signs work every time. Um, I do absolutely have donors who downplay the importance of arts until they meet 
people like Ravi. And so uh, Priya and Paul, thank you for bringing the Why Not Theatre forward. Um, thank you for those who have stayed with us. It's a great crowd that stayed with us an extra half hour. And uh, thanks to the team that, uh, of course, puts all this together and makes it look seamless and easy, which it is not. And uh, so proud of this organization and, and the folks that work here at Toronto Foundation. I'm so um, delighted to have partners in giving like Paul and Priya and our grantees and the work that they do that is so amazing at this time. Please stay healthy, uh, stay together, stay connected. And I hope we'll see you on December the 10th for our final webinar before the holiday. Take care, everyone, and goodbye.